So, a little bit of a delay. Um, next talk is, yeah, we will we'll mostly be around, I think, from on the wire tests. Sometimes suck if you want to get your commits in. Um, so, I hope I don't step on too many people's toes. Um, apologize in advance. Um, If you don't agree with any of this, just uh, throw the food at me, as long as it's not rotten tomatoes. Um, so let's start. Well, the dog has tests. Tests are good. Of course, we want to test our code. And uh, more tests, of course, is better. The more the better. Many, many tests run them all the time. All the time green. All the time people happy. Um, Jenkins was running the tests for every commit. That's our our idea. What we want to have so that we're sure that when you write some new code that you don't introduce reject regressions that everything keeps working. Um, that's the idea. The reality sometimes looks a bit different. For example. This is what happens when you commit a change um, to Garrett. Then Jenkins kicks in. You can't see anything here because it's all pixels only. All you see is that there's three attempts or four attempts. It took four attempts to get the um, Windows build actually working, actually green. So we want to um, do these tests on multiple different platforms. The next window is Mac, um, and whenever one of the tests fails, then the, the, the Jenkins says, This is not good. But most of the time, it's not your fault, it's the fault um, of one of these tests that uh, happened to break for an obvious reason. So, what you do is you reschedule the Jenkins build then to see if, if, if it goes green, and then that's proof you didn't change anything, just rerun the tests, and now they so your code wasn't the fault, it was the fault of the, of the, um, of the test that failed. And, and sometimes it takes like four iterations, um, and at that time you start to think about, the, about all the machine power wasted on this. So your carbon footprint for a garage commit starts to uh, go up, and you think uh, you could just as well take an airplane to Tirana as well, instead of some commit like that. Um, the other way that this shows up is that uh, many people on the mailing lists and on uh, on like ask what. Um, so this is unreadable. Sorry. Um, uh, you start to, to have questions like, I'm doing my first build here. Um, it fails. What can I do? Or I used to do builds all the time and they work and now they start to fail with, with the uh, dubious, in dubious places in the tests and uh, I, but, uh, I don't understand what the issue is, how can I fix it, what am I doing wrong? Um, so this is a typical kind of question that, that newcomers or even old hands have. Um, like there's just today on the mailing list, Luke um, claimed that Something that used to work on a Windows machine for ages now starts to fail routinely. Um, so that's tests that are flaky um, and then cause trouble for problems, cause uh, trouble for people. So natural instinct then is it doesn't work, it breaks. It's software, we can fix it. Sure. So let's let's do that. Um, yeah, let, let's try to do that at least. Because when one of these tests fails, what you typically get is not a nice message that tells you exactly where the failure is and what we would need to change in the code to make it work again, or you get some cryptic long output 
And if multiple tests fail your output, even get mixed if you don't make minus L. Um, so this is an example of something that, that failed. Um, and you see from the CPP unit test, the idea there is always that you add some, some assert in the code in the test code that something should be of an expected outcome, which is one here, and then it shows the actual outcome, which is zero, and then it shows you where in the test code um, that happens. So there's a filters test, CXX file, and on line 145, there is such an assert check whether something is as expected, um, and that obviously failed. Um, but it doesn't give you any, any, any good clue, I mean. Um, should be 1 is 0, or what can that be? But you can look into the test code, of course, to see what it's actually checking there. So let's go look into the test code here. And then everything should be obvious, and we should be able to change whatever changes needed to get that test fixed, and everything will be green again for everybody. And everybody's happy. But let's look at the test code. Um, so this is the part, this red line at the bottom is this assertion check that something should be expected, but actually it's whatever the result is. And the result is, well, the result is up here, either test passed or test failed. So these are enum values, zero or one. So apparently we didn't have it as, as expected, we don't have a one there, um, we don't have a pass there, we have a fail there. Yeah, that's good to know, but why did it fail? Um, so looking further up, the end result is taken from the B result. B res is, oh that's up there. Um, if we are in an export case, are we in an export case? I have no idea, I just see the, the output there. So in one case we would do a load, in the other case we would do a save, and, and then the return value is a boolean, which says whether it worked. Apparently we did either of these and it doesn't work, but uh, that's all we know. That's a bit too little to know to actually fix this and make tests green again and make everybody else happy again. Um, so this is not an ideal way, obviously, to write a test. I mean, it's an ideal way maybe to write production code, because um, we know that things work there, and if they don't, we have a, a scenario that we can debug for our customer who pays us for that. Um, but if our own tests fail, we, we, we want them to be breathing, I and mean, we, we get angry. Um, and we want to debug them now because I want my commit actually to pass and not, not this test. And my commit can't pass because of this broken, so broken test that somebody once wrote. Um, so yeah, we, we need a solution there. Um, what do we do? So one thing we could do is um, resort to the Department of GV talk titles because the title of this talk was um, Taking Testing Mountain and um, there was an album in the 70s by Brian Eno Taking Tiger Mountain from which I ripped this title um, ripped it from an even older film and um, as it turns out um, at that time at least Eno used um, some, some sort of cards with, with uh, instructions or ideas to, to unbreak um, or to, to help your creativity along. And it's quite funny that uh, when you look at these parts today that they devised in the, in the 70s, um, many of them are, some, about, some of them about, are about making music, but many of them could also be used um, for writing better, writing better um, software tests. Um, so we could look at these and, and uh, decide what to do, like shut the door and listen from the outside, or um, mute and continue. Mute and continue is a good idea to 
just carry on with this. Um, but we want to use that, we'll do something else. Um, despite the talk title, cheesiness. So what I will present you in this way, your slides, is a few steps that I think could be helpful if you internalize that while you write and go, you write these tests um, of things you could do to make it easier for your colleagues to later, when these tests do fail, um, to um, have an easier way of, of, of uh, fixing them. So step zero, the ultimate first step always is um, write a test that fails. There is no use of writing a test that originally or the, on, on the first iteration succeeds because for one, I mean that's the, the test of development idea that's also quite open now. Um, for one, you might accidentally don't even execute your test um, because you forgot to add it into the CPU unit test for, for framework, for example, um, which just happened, and then everything will screen when you actually don't test anything. Um, but more important, more important for this talk here is that when you see that test fail, you see the output from the test that failed. And um, if you then think about, is this output any useful? Or will it be useful for somebody else who will see the test fail? You'll, you get a chance to run the test in a way that the output, the failed output, is actually of any use and not just a failed approach. So another thing, uh, I hope this is barely readable at least. I wasn't prepared to, to do even bigger fonts. Um, the next thing of importance is understand what you actually want to test, which sounds trivial because you're writing the test. But if you look closer, um, there's easier ways to, to, to write a test. And that means, but that, that can mean that the test is then harder to back or harder on your colleagues for whom it will fail. Um, for example, there was this one case, or there was a bunch of cases that all um, came down to the same root cause. And then in this case, there's some test in calc that tests some functionality. And then again, um, so somebody came up on the main list of the problem. Um, Test, fail, test always fails for me, expected value is 1, it gives me a 0, it's, uh, and it's some uh, doubles, so floating point computation, so it also gives a delta. Of, uh, we, we already have some, some, some range of values that will be allowed because of the floating point, there's always rounding errors, um, but they're quite far off, so 0 is quite different from 1. Um, so once we have debugged this, what it turned out to be is um, that this was this guy with the failing test used a 32-bit Linux machine. And on 32-bit we need to build with um, without the, the um, newer instructions of the, of, the, of the CPU and these old instructions have a different mode of floating point. And you could enable the newer mode or not with our old baseline, as we have to talk in the ESC right now. Um, so if, if once you had actually debugged this, you found out that the zero versus one difference in the test result uh, broke down to some uh, key inf function in calc um, that was fed with two values and um, returned the wrong result. Um, not the result that was expected by the test, but the test itself had not looked at where's the spec for calc, what are the um, supported results if you feed this function with these values, what is the rounding error that we would allow, because there's no such spec for calc. So there's not even a way to write a useful test for calc 
because we don't know what are the, 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 the values that will be okay. We just execute that and see on ah, my machine with this floating point environment I get this value. So I slap that into the test code. And if, if there's a different value, um, then the test fails. But this might just as well be an acceptable value, or it might not be, in which case we would need to stop um, building pulp for 32 bit Linux until we can get um, the newer CPU instructions to use. So if you if you're just looking at I test something, I try it out, it gives this result, I slap that into a test document, um, then you are you, you didn't break down the problem deep enough to actually test against something that will be specified what the, what the expected outcome actually is. So you hope that the outcome that you see is the right one um, and then codify it in your test code. But it doesn't help if somebody else has a machine that also would have a better result but quite different from yours. And we also see that of course with many tests that use fonts, so it depends on who has more fonts installed in your system. So text metrics, if you check for these, they differ. And um, the next step up the mountain is um, maybe quite paradoxical. Um, right, test that feels like that concrete. Um, so the, 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 the pragmatic programmers, these two guys, who wrote those books, um, have a principle that is called dry, don't repeat yourself. Um, so whenever you have something that you write twice in your code, abstract from it, put it into a constant, if it's a value, or make it into a function, um, where you pass different values into, um, so that you don't write the same code twice. Which, of course, is the advice um, that is good for normal code. But when you write test code, as we've seen before, there were these functions um, where we did either a load or a save and then just check for return value, um, which just gave us a boot, gave us no information what exactly failed. So if you write a test code, you want to do every individual step, spell it out individually, check all the intermittent values that you get to see where exactly did the failure come in. So it doesn't help if, if in the end you see, oh, it didn't work out because somewhere in the middle some, some wrong turn was taken. So for, for test code, paradoxically in a way, the ideal would be to have code that is not dry but completely wet and um, where you don't use any abstractions completely kind of concrete code, so wait to wet concrete instead of skating over dry, skating through a dry level that you don't find your way back once the failure happens. Um, kind of any CPD unit is served with a message, for example, you, you can add a, a, a third, you can have the, the actual value and, and the expected value and also give some message in the failure case which tells us which, can, which is a string that can tell you something about the context. But as soon as you read that, um, that's kind of a red flag that you use some abstraction somewhere so that multiple paths through your test end up at the same assert check and you need to um, demultiplex there which part it was that, that ran into that failure. So, um, of course, this is, this is, there's no silver bullet here, so um, spreading the code too far um, doesn't, doesn't work as well. So, if you then wait through a, a million lines, um, it's not ideal either. So, that might be an indication that your test is you're testing just too much of the same um, over and over again. But please do keep this in mind as. as there's two extremes, um, and, and for test code, 
prefer to go more to the wet side of things than to the ideal of dry coal that we want for production coal or coal, coal on the test. And the next step, uh, keep up with this quote from Michael on RC recently. Um, yes, randomized test code, of course, is a source of pain. Um, there's these obvious uses of random, even if you would always use the same seed so that the values will always be the same, I think it goes against the previous uh, advice of uh, writing batch code. So, why don't you then compute a the handful of values that you then explicitly use in your test code? Instead of, of uh, using some like some for loop with a, with a random value that you see that to the deterministic value at least. Um, and there's of course other sources of homogenism like races with, with multiple threading, which is harder to avoid than avoiding uh, the call to random function. Um, but yeah, we'll keep this in mind. We, we used to have quite some, some tests, at least the UNO test that tested for the Different uh, properties of the of all these you know objects that did use um, random or did pick random properties to change them to random values and then sometimes they failed because the random value wasn't supported by this one randomly picked property. So that's a that's a fun place to buy. The next step. Similar, somewhat similar to the first, uh, to, to the third, is that also the environment in which you run your tests should be deterministic and should always be in the same state. Um, and for our test, that mostly means that um, these tests often open documents, and um, the the LibreOffice code is so that when you open the document putting the log file next to it that says this file is locked by such and such person. Um, so if somebody else tries to open it, um, then you will get an error or a message box um, that you can't open it because somebody else is already uh, changing it. So what we do for most of the tests is either open them in a, in a read-only mode so that the log file doesn't get written or move these tests documents over to some safe place in the work tier because every test has some place in the work tier that gets cleared before the test is run and afterwards if the test succeeded. Um, so there's a natural place to place your document uh, and the log the file will get there and when the test is done a second time, the log file uh, is removed again. So this was one um, line test I ran into the other day, um, probably unreadable again. What happened there is um, that I ran the test, the log file was created, I then saw that I had mistyped my make check line. I also wanted to make that screenshot, make check screenshot thing, so I cancelled the build. Um, the log file was still there. I then got off uh, the virtual network, which meant that for some reason my, um, my host name, as the browser sees, had changed from A to B. Um, I then restarted the test, went to bed, it came back to a line test that didn't do anything um, because this is one of the headless mode tests that when they run into an issue and want to display something, they just uh, can't display it because they have no, no screen, they think, and, and then just, just, just hang. Um, and the, the solution, of course, was. Um, to, to, to just not get this test, this uh, log file written into the source tree where it wasn't deleted properly, but to first copy the test document over to this workplace per test. Um, and we have functionality for that for all the different kind of tests. This is also a Python written UI test, but there's the same boilerplate for all, for all tests, so do use these functionalities. And finally, once we've reached the top of the hill, um, and we've come to the end of the talk for time, 
Um, do subscribe to this one mailing list. We have a mailing list where all the Jenkins bots post their favors. And um, so that's not the garbage changes that you um, submit there, but the, the, the regular Tinder box builds. We have this master page as well for the old bots, but we also have a mailing list where you can get all the failures of all these different platforms. And um, there is like, well, I wouldn't want to lie, but easily there's 20 mails per day. Most of them from the Windows ones that have gotten to the PDF export for one reason or another, or still with the fonts for one reason or another. And um, you get a pointer into the failed build block, and you can see exactly where it failed. You can because uh, the test doesn't tell you much. But if you are able to fix one of these ever recurring failures, then you'll be our hero um, because that will be one step down from this repeat the build four times until the Garrett commit or until Jenkins said that the Garrett commit is green because it failed in four different um, ways the tests on Windows. Um, so please go ahead and, and, and do that. Thank you.